which just don't buy them at the dollar store. Yeah, don't buy junk at the dollar store. Gotta keep, them out of the sun. Gotta keep everything out of the sun. That was one of the first three things we said. Where you gotta keep your stuff here? dry, keep it out of the sun. Because he's right, no matter what plastic you're using, no matter what glass you're using, if it's exposed to sunlight, you're killing the food inside. Water that you can take with you. Now you see the water bottle, oh, water bottle there, Eric. You see these types of water bottles. The plastic that these are made from is different than this plastic. This is where a lot of people get confused. That plastic is basically made out of corn oil. And it's the same stuff that they make milk jugs out of. And the reason why they make it out of that is because they break down and dehydrate, or will biodegrade in a landfill quicker than this will. You put this in a landfill, 100 years from now, someone's going to dig up and go, what the hell's that? 100 years from now, they're not going to be able to find any of that. They might find the cap because it will degrade in the ground. But what that means for storage is, is that will become porous and leak like Eric spoke of his uh, Ziploc bags, same way. It's the same plastic used to make the Ziploc bags. What you guys are looking at here in front of you, I know it's like a hodgepodge of just canned goods. I have a theory of food storage when it comes to short-term storage and my method of doing things I've been doing for a long time. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm not new to this. I've been doing this for about 20 years. My food storage, I've gone through every incarnation from pretending I had a grocery store in my basement to stacking stuff up and, and buying everything I can on sale whenever I can find it. And depending on your lifestyle and your situation, you've got to figure out what works best for you. So we're going to concern ourselves today with me explaining my method of doing this so you guys can understand it. You see the black bin that sits there before you on the ground? I think you guys saw me when I came in. The yellow plastic lid that goes on it. You pick these up at Home Depot, hell, they're on sale now for eight bucks. That container is strong enough to hold 500 pounds of weight. They interlock and stack on top of each other, and at the same time, they're watertight. Hey, real quick, I just picked up two of those at Home Depot, and you have to smell them. They are extruded polyurethane. Yes. And if you have an amateur extruder on the machine, the urethane burns, and it's some of them have a very strong smell to them. Um, there were different designs. I noticed that one design is a little less stinky than the other, but basically it just smelled like charcoal. So get the ones that don't smell like charcoal. And yeah, they're $8.98. They're yeah, I've been, using the, I've been using the same style bin now for over five years, doing what I do with this, and I have no complaints. In fact, they're part of, they're part of my bug out plan because three of these and a piece of plywood makes a really nice elevated bed for my fat ass. So, that being said, when it comes to food storage, always trust a fat man, never trust a skinny chef, okay? That's a joke, you're supposed to laugh. All right, that's two of you, okay. My theory of how this works is in my storage bins. I have six of them, and I rotate them. Every month, I go through one bin. I dump the damn thing out, and I virtually pick up and look at every can. I check the best buy dates, look at the seals. Every now and then, you come across one that's dented or broken. I had a dented one here a minute ago. I can't find it. You find a dented one, inspect the seals. Here's what you do with this. In the bin, I put, for every two people, about 100 bucks worth of groceries. And when I say groceries, I mean in cans. Retail cans couple of reasons for that and it doesn't make a lot of sense until you start thinking about what you do with this and the women that do the cooking out there they can explain it to you guys sometime this is a chunky soup pretty damn tasty per can of something it's got a few vegetables it's got some beef it's got broth but the big <coughs> part about this is is while this can of broth and a cup of rice takes this from being a snack for one guy to a meal for two people and you've got to start thinking about how you're going to prepare meals. You're not going to sit down at your microwave and zap something post-event. You know, you've got to assume that you're going to have a hard time cooking what you have. But here's the, the main thing about this. You pop that top, you can eat the damn thing cold if you want to. It's not going to hurt you. It's quite edible. Actually, it's not even bad. I tried it. But 
The point is, is this is a base that you can add to to take this, a can of black beans, a handful of rice, and you throw it into a pot, now you've made a stew that'll feed three or four people. It's actually not going to taste bad, but the main thing is it's going to give you protein and carbs on complex levels, so it's a complete meal. It'll, you'll live off of this and you'll live well. Same thing with things like no bean chili. I buy some with beans, some without. The main thing you're going to have to overcome post-event with your food storage, food fatigue. <coughs> Anybody that's ever been in the military will tell you, you do not want to eat MREs for more than a day. Two if you have to. After that, your digestive tract really hates you, and everybody around you doesn't really like you a whole lot. It's the same situation. You can get really tired of eating food that all tastes and looks and smells the same. That's another reason why this is done up. There's everything in front of you. Here we go. Clam chowder, which there's the dented can. In my storage going through this, this is a can that I wouldn't <coughs> put back in there. And I would take like this can of black beans and say it's out of date. So once a month when I dump out this, this one, this one uh, bin of uh, cans and go through them all, I pull out all the ones I'm going to remove from the, from the bin, put everything else back in. And I take the three or four or five cans, whatever it is, and I immediately go down to the big chicken, giant eagle, or wherever you're going for your food, and I buy the exact same cans of what I have. And I buy it at one time and get a receipt for it. There's a reason for that, so if you pay attention, you'll understand. You get a receipt for the exact same things you got because you just bought the replacements. Now you take this food, set it aside, and you're going to donate it or you're going to eat it. When I say donate it, I don't eat a whole lot of black beans, although I do like them. And I like clam chowder, but I may not want this can of clam chowder. I may have five of them in my pantry in the kitchen. But the point is, is you either put this in the pantry or your kitchen and eat it before it goes bad. Because the truth is, it's only six, six months to two years old. It's fine. It's not going bad. You still got another six months to eat it. So if you don't want to eat it, Donate it. Get out of the church, get out of the food kitchen, and donate your six cans of food you have and say, here, I brought you these, here's a receipt. Would you please write me a receipt for the donation? Every charity knows to do this because it's needed for a tax write-off. The point is, is, every month you're going to have a donation like this with a cash register receipt for the current value of its replacement, not for what you paid for it two years ago which way prices of food go up, that's nice to know. Now you have a tax deduction with the documentation to back it up. IRS won't argue with you. You can do this all you want, and they'll look at you and smile. It's a way to spread some good karma forward. Because you're feeding somebody you can use the food if you don't want it. So the point is, is while the old theory of store what you eat, eat what you store sounds good in the book you read, or on the internet web page, or this guy on the YouTube said it, the truth is, is it doesn't matter. It's the food you're going to eat when you're hungry. And quite frankly, if Brad's hungry, he's going to eat this can of black beans. But i got to show you a secret. He and Lori gave me this. So the point is, is you may not want to eat it now, but it's the food you want to store for when you need to eat it. Now, if you'll notice up here, you don't see things like mac and cheese. You don't see a lot of that stuff. You can add to that, put that stuff in here if you want. Stick with the canned goods first. That's your first layer of your food storage. <clears throat> if I haven't lost you on the bin theory, I have six of those bins stacked in different places in my house. I store everything in them from a camp and a box for when we go to a bug out, I grab the box and I go. And it has all my camping gear in it. I have another one full of food. I can grab it and go. The point is, is if you're in a situation where you have these stored up and stacked up, if you gotta go, grab one and go. And you know that you have enough food for your family for 30 days. Regardless of what happens, worst case scenario, you may have to figure out how to carry it all in a backpack later, but when you're throwing it in your car, your truck, and you're going down the road, you got 30 days worth of food. If you're going to your cousin's house three, three states over or 100 miles away, it's nice to show up with 30 days of food. They'll be a whole lot happier to see you because whether you're 
in the micro microcosm of where your event happened, or if you're out of the zone of it, but it's still affected by it, having 30 days worth of food is going to make a whole lot of difference in your life. So that being said, once a month, grab a bin, bring it down, go through it, get your replacement stuff, put it back in, and it goes to the bottom of the stack. Next month, grab the next one. Do it again. Next month, do the next. Do it again. The whole point is, I have six bins. I will now have seven. But I have six bins full of food. I go through them twice a year. So a situation like what happened to Eric, I'll know of before it's a disaster. Because I'm in that, bat, I'm in that bin twice a year. Your second layer of your food storage comes to your long-term stuff. Your oats, your rice, health, pasta, ramen noodles, sugar, all this stuff, your staples. That's what I put into buckets. Those bucket items are what I take, I call them force multipliers. Again, another reference for you military guys. It's the force multiplier of your food. You give me a selection of five of the five gallon buckets that I have in one of these bins, and I can feed six people for 30 days and have food left over. And we'll eat fine. And no one's gonna get in major digestive trouble because they're eating something that they've never eaten before. They're all gonna eat fine, everybody's gonna be healthy, and we'll get through. Let me shoot a deer in that process, and all of a sudden, that's a whole other story. I got more food for, for another six, eight people. It all comes down to your options and what you do. So, I know that other people have different ways of doing food storage. That's mine, and it really works well for me. And I got to tell you, going through a divorce a couple of years ago, uh, I lost a couple of my bins in the process. But it was really nice to say, when I had to go somewhere to get another place to live, I just went into storage and I grabbed two bins and threw them in my truck and I drove off. And, and it, it has worked out. It's the insurance policy. While we all think of let's grab gear and bug out and pack our bag with this and pack our 72 hour kit with that, that's just all wonderful. But in the real world, 90 to 95% of the emergencies you have to come across or deal with, you're going to want this type of food. Seen one? This is a bucket wrench. And I'm telling you right now, they're two bucks on Amazon. Buy a couple. You're going to really like them. Hey, we'll save your fingers and save your knuckles. Uh, guys that deal with uh, drywall or a lot of painters, they live on these things because they open the five gallon buckets like they're nothing. But it's an awesome tool to have, and it's, it's pocket changed up by one. What about I would say storing stuff in a garage is a bad place to store it. But if it's all you've got, it's all you've got. You want to keep your stuff at a base temperature, as cool as possible, but not freezing, and as stable as possible. What affects the food isn't the temperature of the food as much as it is the rise and the fall of the temperature. It'll break it down. So for long-term storage, like I have, a, I have a fruit cellar in the house. Uh, a lot of us do. If you don't have one, look at digging one in your yard. Uh, they're awesome. But the point is, is underground, your, your temperature is base and it's leveled out, and you don't get the wide fluctuations like today. 54 degrees, and I woke up this morning. By the time we go home tonight, it's going to be snowing. It is snowing. Is it snowing now? Exactly my point. But uh, whoever it was that asked about the oxygen absorbers, what to do with them once you've opened them. A mason jar is your secret. Literally, it will save you. When you open up the... the uh, O2 absorbers, stick them all right in the jar, including the eye. Put the eye to the outside of the lid so you can see it through the glass. Wedge it in there, seal that lid up, close that sucker up. Now, only open it one more time that day. And that's the day that you go to put an O2 absorber in every bucket or every two liter bottle or whatever you have. Just don't buy them at the dollar store. Yeah, don't buy junk at the dollar store.